Maui, now a disaster zone this Thursday night. This was a home. An inferno devours a tourist town. The heartbreaking losses. We are grieving with each other. As people rush to escape. A blueprint to get greener and cleaner. Canada's plan for a net zero power grid. The praise. This is a huge step forward. The pushback. The draft regulations are unconstitutional and what it could mean for your bottom line. The first home savings account. We reality check the program supposed to help potential homeowners. And mission to the moon. What Canadian astronaut Jeremy Hansen is looking forward to learning, plus his take on UFOs. Global National with Donna Friesen. Reporting tonight, Farah Nasser. Oh my God. The idyllic island of Maui in Hawaii is now a wasteland. A major wildfire wiped out much of the historic town of Lahaina off the map. The inferno sparked on Tuesday, fueled by dry conditions and hurricane winds. A trail of heartbreak and ruin left behind. Good evening to you and thanks for joining us. High-end Maui hotels obliterated. Hawaiians, homes and neighborhoods now a disaster zone. At least 53 people have died from wildfires that have decimated the popular tourist destination. Search and rescue missions are underway. Thousands, including Canadians, had to scramble to safety when the flames erupted. Jackson Prosco reports on the aftermath. There is almost nothing left of historic Lahaina. The popular tourist town, once the capital of the Kingdom of Hawaii, is all but gone. This is not even the worst of it. Still get dead bodies in the water, floating, and on the seawall. They've been sitting there since last night. Let's go! The fire swept through in just minutes. Is anybody still out here? It's time to go! Burning all the way to the ocean. Alan Dakar recorded these final moments outside his store. That fire was raging out of control. Grabbed some people who didn't have a way out. Told them get their stuff, get in my truck, and we headed out. There's a desperate search underway for survivors and victims. Many evacuees are only now learning they've lost everything. Woke up this morning and got on our phones to pictures of our house, uh, just down to the slab, nothing but smoke. Multiple fires have been burning out of control since Tuesday, searing the dry brush and everything in their path. Hundreds of people are homeless, thousands have no power and no way to communicate. We are grieving with each other during this inconsolable time. At Maui's main airport, there are long lines for flights off the island. In Vancouver, the first Canadians returned home with harrowing stories of escape. The police came, like there were sirens, and they told everyone to evacuate. It's hard to like begin even processing it. Right now, I'm just thinking about how like every single picture I took, there was like all burnt down. Like it's all like places that don't exist. The fires are getting closer and closer to our hotel room, and we had no communication, little food. All non-essential travel to Maui is discouraged. Ferry flights are bringing people home. So relieved. Great. So relieved. Yeah, and I feel bad for the people in Maui and the places that we were in were beautiful. Places that are now gone. With recovery still underway, it's too soon to talk rebuilding. Look at the harbor. The fires made history and destroyed it, leaving Maui forever scarred. Oh my God. God. Jackson Prosco, Global News. Joining me on the ground is NBC correspondent Dana Griffin. Uh, Dana, you're outside one of the largest evacuation centers in Maui. What are you hearing from people who've lost everything in the past 48 yeah. hours? Yeah. Hi, Farah. It's about 11.30 a.m. local time. So we're seeing a lot more people wake up, show up, coming here to get food, shelter. About three to 400 people slept here last night. And just some of the stories are remarkable. Heard from a couple who had to walk 15 miles from their home to safety. They learned this morning that their home is no longer there. A neighbor managed to text them. We're hearing other stories of how people had to escape and saw a wall of flames sitting on top of Lahaina, which is just de devastated right now. It's in ruins. The word we're hearing a lot is apocalyptic people concerned about what natural resources, what 
historical landmarks, businesses, homes still remain. It's unclear when residents will be allowed to get back to that neighborhood. But Farah, a lot of them will have no home to go to. We learned moments ago from the Maui Fire Department that they have contained the fire. They say it's about 80 percent contained. Now, that means the fire is not out, but it is very significant and a very much needed improvement considering their efforts were hampered yesterday by those very strong wind gusts. And we have felt some of those gusts here today, but the winds have died down significantly, which hopefully will aid them in their fight. And again, residents here trying to put the pieces together. One surprising thing I've noticed, a lot of people we've talked to while they are heartbroken and devastated, there's a sense of optimism and gratitude that they made it on line. And again, they were still stuck this thing. Edge tonight. Cara. Dana Griffin in Maui, thank you for that. And as you heard from Jackson earlier, the way the disaster unfolded, it was rapid and it was fueled by harsh winds. On Tuesday afternoon, a Category 4 hurricane passing 1,200 kilometers to the south of Hawaii caused wind gusts approaching 100 kilometers per hour to race down the hillside across Maui. Now, combined with drought conditions, it was a terrible recipe for a firestorm. These before and after images of Lahaina's formerly picturesque waterfront now reduced to ashes. Entire neighborhoods are now gone. Ottawa has unveiled its proposed regulations designed to bring Canada's electricity grid to net zero by 2035. That these regulations have been carefully designed following intense consultations to maximize the reduction of carbon pollution while still providing a reliable, affordable grid. Provinces and territories have 75 days to comment on the rules. Many environmental groups are applauding the plan, but as Taria Isri reports, there are still questions about the use of natural gas and how much the changes will cost. Canada is embarking on an electric future, and there's finally a roadmap for how to get there. This is the spark to get us to net zero. The federal government unveiled a long-awaited blueprint for a net zero power grid. A future where energy is clean, affordable and reliable. A future where we can generate good jobs without creating greenhouse gas pollution. The country's electrical system is already 80% clean, but demand is expected to surge with vehicles, buses and trains going green. I think this is a huge step forward. We've been working for over a decade to see governments properly centre clean electricity. The proposed changes would cut an estimated 340 megatons of greenhouse gas pollution over the next 25 years. That's equivalent to taking more than 100 million vehicles off the road. But Ottawa is making some exceptions for communities that rely on non-renewable energy, like diesel. We are disappointed to see some allowances for natural gas on the grid in the year 2035 and even beyond. The federal government insists it needs to be flexible as it launches an electric revolution. But economists say it won't come cheap. Nobody should try to sugarcoat this. I think there's a legitimately open question about whether our energy bills come down in the future or go up. Upgrading the power grid across the country will cost an estimated $400 billion. The federal government is pledging $40 billion in financial incentives to help cover the costs. Environmentalists say it will pay off and Canadians will spend less money on energy in the long run. The ball is really in the court of provinces to do what they need to do to embrace this electric future. The final regulations will be unveiled next year, but won't come into effect until 2035. It's unlikely any of the targets will be reached unless the provinces get on board. Taria Isri, Global News, Ottawa. Now, the proposed changes are already getting pushed back from two of Canada's largest oil producing provinces. The premiers of Alberta and Saskatchewan argue electricity regulation isn't up to the federal government and have already refused to implement the regulations. Heather Yorks West explains the backlash and the concerns this could become a battle for jurisdiction. In a province where fortunes are tied to oil and gas and new wind and solar projects have been put on a seven-month hold, Ottawa's plan to clean the electricity grid is not sitting well. The draft regulations are unconstitutional, irresponsible, unrealistic and would make life less affordable for Albertans and Canadians. They will not be implemented in our province, period. 
Saskatchewan's Premier also says his province will not comply. We will not ask our residents to pay the extraordinary price for the federal government's divisive policies, Scott Moe said over social media. Nor will we risk the integrity of our provincial power grid to defy the laws of thermodynamics. I mean, I'd like to see their numbers. I'd like to see where, what is it that they're assuming. I think they're right to say it's a heavy lift. I don't know that they're right to say it's impossible. The federal regulations don't go as far as some in the industry feared. After 2035, the use of oil and gas will be more regulated, but the grid will not be fossil fuel free. Still, the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers expressed disappointment that natural gas won't play a larger role in future power production, fearing the policy will keep investors away. The scale of the energy transition is so large that we need all forms of energy, including oil, including natural gas. It's the emissions we don't want. When it comes to cleaning the electricity grid, Alberta and Saskatchewan have the longest way to go. Unlike provinces with well-established hydro or nuclear networks, natural gas and coal currently account for more than 80% of Alberta's and Saskatchewan's electricity. A daunting transition the prairie provinces say they aren't willing to tackle by 2035. Heather Urex west Global News, Calgary. It's desperate times if you're in the market for a home of your own. Prices are through the roof, and residential building construction has slowed in recent months. Now, we know that 22 million homes are needed by 2030 to help with Canada's huge housing affordability crisis, but new data from Statistics Canada shows the number of residential building permits across the country is actually down in four provinces, including Ontario and one territory. While the supply issue is going to take some time to solve, the Liberal government says a new savings account for first-time home buyers is helping people get into the market. Mackenzie Gray reports. Nice to see you, and thanks for your work. It's her signature policy to a major political problem. Christian Freeland selling the first home savings account. And I'm really aware that housing is a huge, huge challenge, to put it mildly. So how does it work? Potential new homeowners can deposit up to eight grand a year in a new account and get tax deductions like an RSP contribution. But when they withdraw the cash to buy their first home, it's tax free, just like a TFSA. I think the program is a great program. It's really going to help uh, Canadians to get uh, a bigger down payment to save for the purchase of, the, of a first home. Eligible applicants can deposit up to 40 grand a year over the lifetime of the account, but opening one can be a challenge. Despite being able to offer them since April, TD, BMO, CIBC, and Scotiabank still don't have the accounts available. RBC and National, the only two major institutions that do. It would be great to see it to see this first home savings account more readily available across the country. Even if it is available, it would only make a small dent in sky-high house prices. The eight grand representing only 1.1% of the cost of an average property and only 5% of an average 20% down payment. Money that would likely increase demand without addressing housing supply. These kind of demand supportive measures really don't end up helping affordability. Uh, because they just put further upward pressure on, on home prices. Affordability likely continue to be elusive, with the Canadian Housing and Mortgage Corporation projecting Canada will be short 3.5 million homes by 2030, adding that drastic transformation is needed from governments. A partial solution gaining steam amongst academic and banks, reducing immigration to pre-pandemic levels. After the Bank of Canada recently said the 1.8 million permanent residents, temporary foreign workers and international students who entered Canada in 2022, have helped keep house prices high. We are trying to do immigration policy first and hoping that housing policy will work its way out. Don't expect a change from the Liberals on immigration. New Housing Minister Sean Fraser has said his focus is on building new homes. And Conservative leader Pierre Polyev has sidestepped questions, Farah, on whether he'd keep the Liberal plan. Mackenzie Gray in Ottawa. Thank you, Mackenzie. A deadly weather system coming up, the tropical storm slamming South Korea. Intense winds and rain pummeled South Korea as tropical storm Kanun made landfall a day after wreaking havoc in Japan. At least one person drowned in the flooding. Forecasters had warned part of the country could see up to 50 centimeters of rain. 14,000 people have been forced to leave their homes. The storm is moving toward North Korea. And a shocking political development in Ecuador. A presidential candidate was assassinated during a campaign event. 
And a warning, this footage is disturbing. You will hear gunshots, and then we're freezing the video. This appears to be the moment shots were fired at Fernando Villa Vicencio. Nine others were injured. Ecuador's outgoing president declared a national state of emergency following the assassination, calling it a political crime and an attempt to sabotage the electoral process. Via Vicencio was a vocal critic of corruption and organized crime. Ecuadorians say the murder reflects a rising wave of insecurity in the country. Ecuador's election is still scheduled for August 20th. Cash cut off ahead why the World Bank isn't lending money to Uganda. An emergency summit is underway in Nigeria as the 15-member Economic Community of West African States discuss how to restore democracy after last month's coup in Niger. The chairman of the group says the military-backed takeover poses a threat to the entire region. Niger's military junta defied the August 6 deadline to reinstate the democratically elected president. They have so far not engaged in any meaningful talks with the bloc, which today ordered the activation of a standby military force for possible use against the junta. The World Bank has halted new lending to Uganda, saying the country's harsh anti-LGBTQ2 plus laws violate its values. Uganda's president remains defiant today, vowing to find alternative sources of credit, saying he's focused on reducing borrowing and will not bow to international pressure. Same-sex relationships were already illegal in Uganda. The new law signed in May added the death penalty for same-sex transmission of HIV, deliberate or not, and for aggravated homosexuality. Next, I speak with Jeremy Hansen about the challenges of preparing to go to the moon. Three, two, one, release, release, release. Virgin Galactic's VSS Unity released from its mothership this morning, carrying its first tourist to space. During the brief flight, the trio of tourists got to experience a few minutes of weightlessness before landing. Canadian astronaut Jeremy Hansen will also be taken to the skies next fall. Hansen and his Artemis II colleagues got their first look this week at the Orion spacecraft that will orbit the Earth twice and then carry them around the moon before rocketing them back home. And we are so pleased to have Canadian astronaut Jeremy Hansen joining us now from Houston. Uh, such an honor and pleasure to speak with you. Thanks for being with us. It's my pleasure, Farah. So let me ask you first, I mean, you saw the ship, as you call it, for the very first time. What was that like for you? I mean, you've dreamed about being an astronaut for a long time. That moment, take us there. Pretty special moment for myself and and my crew. Um, you know, it just gets very real for you. We've been we've been in mockups of this um, capsule many times. We know where stuff is supposed to be and kind of what it's supposed to look like. It's simulated in Houston for us, but traveling to Florida and seeing the actual one that they're working on, it's not quite finished. There's still lots of work to be done. But uh, to see the real hardware, to see how pristine it is, um, was just really kind of magical for us to look inside. When we leave Earth, we will set a course such that eight days later, we will come back and hit the Earth and land in the Pacific Ocean. That's like, it's like threading a needle from here to the moon away. And it's really, really difficult and really, really important because if you get it wrong, you die. This mission will tell us more about human life on Mars and and, and what, what are you looking for in that? And, and what do you think we're gonna learn from it? Yeah, I think what's important to understand is that what, what we're doing when we lay out our, our return journey to the moon over the course of many, many Artemis missions, we're, we're charting a course to Mars. We're thinking about, okay, what are the pieces we're missing to get to Mars? What do we have to learn that we can learn on the moon that is only you know three days away essentially uh, before we actually go to Mars? And that's sort of what it's, what it's all about. Let's talk about that adventure. I know, I know your focus right now is not uh, Mars. It's your, it's your mission, the mission ahead of you. But if you were asked to go to Mars, would you go? <laughs> yeah, I'd have to, I'd have to have another chat with the family to see if, uh, if that got approved. But I, I would like in 
in here in this heart, I would I want to say yes. Uh, I'm very much interested in a round trip mission mm. uh, to Mars um, and just be a magical place to visit. It's so mysterious out there, um, and and you you're a fighter pilot. I mean, would you give us some some of your um, thoughts on UFOs and, and UFO testimony that we've heard? You know, I can only relate my story as a fighter pilot, Canadian fighter pilot. I, I spent many a night sleeping in a hangar uh, beside an armed aircraft, waiting for the alarm to go off to scramble to go intercept whatever needed to be intercepted. And, and I had kind of secretly hoped, you know, I was a big fan of the X Files. If people know what that is, um, you know, I wanted to believe. Um, and I secretly hoped that someday I would see evidence from, you know, another planet uh, visiting Earth. I never did. There are no, um, you know, no secret briefings that these things exist. I think the fact that we see things in the sky, those things are real. Um, I don't think there's any doubt about that. And they are unidentified and we don't know what the sources of them are. Um, but they're not, in my opinion, extraterrestrial. I don't think that evidence exists. At least I haven't seen it yet as much as I would like to believe. But it is worth trying to figure out, you know, where are these coming from? Who are the entities that are creating them and flying them around different parts of the world? Um, I think there's a lot uh, to be looked into there. Astronaut Jeremy Hansen, thanks so much for being generous with your time and joining us on Global National. Yeah, it's my pleasure. I'm so proud of Canada right now. I think it's just really highlighting the genius in our country that we have been invited to go on this mission back to the moon the first time in over 50 years. The reason I'm on this mission is very little to do with me. I had to do my part. But the reality is it has to do with thousands of Canadians who who bought into a goal, a vision of doing great things by collaborating. And now their genius is being recognized and it's being asked from our international partners to for us to contribute the, that genius. And uh, I think it reflects really well in Canada. Well, we're so proud that you're representing us. Thank you again. My pleasure. Have a great day. And that's Global National for this Thursday night. I'm Farah Nasser. Thank you for spending part of your evening with us. And tonight's Air Canada is Kootenay Lake near Caslow, British Columbia. Until tomorrow, take care of yourselves and take care of each other. Good night.